Well, um, thank you for the introduction, Kevin, and, and thank you, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Suyash Prasad. I'm a, a pediatrician by training. I trained in the UK and Australia and uh, moved into clinical research and drug development about 20 years ago. I spent my time really in rare and severe pediatric uh, metabolic and neurological disease, drug development, and uh, in recent years have also um, have also developed an expertise and interest in gene therapeutic approaches to treating um, rare and severe pediatric uh, metabolic disease. So I'm going to be spending some time talking to you about Tasha gene therapies, where I'm the chief medical officer and the head of research and development, and our approach to treating um, our approach to treating uh, GM2 gangliosidosis. So I'll touch on Tasha, talk about our program specifically, share a little bit of the preclinical data. Uh, really spend some time discussing our, our patient-focused approach to clinical development and regulator interaction, how we go about this and why it's important, and then also um, touch on some clinical trial updates. Uh, we have a, an up-and-running clinical trial in Canada, and we'll be opening up a study in the US later on this year, and I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about that. So, Tasha Gene Therapies. Tasha is a company, we're based in Dallas, Texas. And uh, we've not been around for too long. We've been around for about a year and a half. And our focus is AAV9, um, gene therapy approaches to treating rare and severe neurological disease. We have a very broad portfolio. We have about 26 programs in our portfolio at various stages of development. And uh, GM2 is one of our very first programs coming along. So as I say, we've uh, opened up clinical trials this year. I'm looking forward to uh, obtaining some data to share with you uh, later on in the year. Now, the name Tasha uh, actually uh, comes from the Caddo Native American language, meaning ally or friend. And um, we're born out of a foundational collaboration with UT Southwestern, who are a, a gene therapy and pediatric neurology center of excellence based in Dallas, Texas. And that collaboration and our collaboration with, with patients and families mean we really want to be an ally to the rare disease community. And that is what the name Tasha actually uh, reflects and represents. So we have this patient-focused approach to clinical development that I'll tell you about shortly. We have this foundational collaboration with UT Southwestern. Uh, in particular, Burj Manassian, who heads up the Division of Pediatric Neurology, is actually the largest pediatric neurology residence program in the US. So they have a wonderful team there. And also in conjunction with Stephen Gray, who heads up the gene therapy uh, vector core. Um, and he has a, a really uh, amazing team of gene therapy researchers. And we partner with them um, across our portfolio of programs. And the GM2 gene therapy approach was designed by Stephen Gray in partnership with a collaborator up at Queen's Hospital in Ontario, uh, whose name is Jody Wallier. We uh, like to leverage a commercially proven gene therapy platform. And what I mean by that is that AAV9 as a serotype is, uh, is actually approved as a gene therapy approach for a disease known as spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, and in fact, close to a thousand patients have been treated with that. So there is commercial precedent and uh, regulatory precedent for an AAV9 gene therapy approach. And these are the three foundational aspects to Tasha. AAV9 vector, which has been demonstrated safe and efficacy across multiple CNS indications. We have a very validated manufacturing process. So we use HEK293 mammalian cell suspension, which is also validated. It's also the, the commercial product for the Zolgesmus SMA product. It's a commercial manufacturer for the Zolgesma SMA product. And we like to give the drug intrathecally. So this is uh, into the lower spine um, where we inject the intrathecal, uh, drug intrathecally. Uh, we have the patient lying flat and tilted head down a little bit. So the drug then uh, through gravity pulls around the brain where it can then be absorbed into the brain cells. And um, so we're really targeting the specific tissue that needs to be treated. Uh, as opposed to giving the drug systemically into a vein. That's our high level approach to um, our portfolio of CNS programs. Let me now focus more specifically on gene replacement therapy for GM2 gangliosidosis, so both Tay-Sachs and Sandoff disease. Now, as you all know, the primary enzyme that's missing here is beta hexosaminidase A, abbreviated to hex A. In the absence of hex A, you're gonna build up of GM2 gangliosidase in the lysosomes of the cells. That uh, they, that builds up, the lysosomes rupture, spill out their enzymatic uh, 
um, and the acidic contents therefore causing tissue damage, which results in the clinical phenotype of GM2 ganglicidosis. And there's a progression. Uh, and as we know, there are dire consequences for, in particular, the infertile form of GM2 ganglicidosis. So our approach is to, to replace that enzyme that's missing by uh, replacing the DNA that codes for that particular enzyme. Okay. Now, importantly, one nuance to this enzyme is that it's made up of two subunits, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. Now, mutation of the alpha subunit gives you Tay-Sachs disease, mutation of the beta subunit gives you um, Sandoff disease. But essentially, clinically and from a treatment perspective, we believe it can be treated in the same way by replacing both the alpha and the beta. Therefore, you can replace enzyme that is deficient both in Tay-Sachs and in Sandoff. And we do this, uh, as you can see in the picture on the right side of this slide, this is our construct. So we have the, uh, the DNA coding for the alpha subunit in the light blue and the DNA coding for the beta subunit also in the light blue. They're connected by a peptide linker, that's in the yellow, the P2A peptide linker, and they're wrapped up in a self-complementary AAV9 capsid. This is the viral shell that holds the genetic material. Now it's driven off the CAG promoter, the CAG promoter, which is a strong promoter and it drives high levels, both of alpha subunits and beta subunit within each cell. So what will happen is that we direct the drug intrathecally, it travels to the brain cell, the capsid enters the brain cell, the DNA pops out and starts producing both alpha and beta subunits in a one-to-one -one ratio within the cell. The alpha and the beta join up in the cell to produce functioning heterodimeric beta hexosaminidase A enzyme, thereby replacing the enzyme that's missing in GM2 ganglioside. Thus, we hope that will result in breakdown of any accumulated GM2 ganglioside, resolution of any inflammatory process of ongoing, and hopefully stabilization of disease and then functional improvement perhaps. Now, that's how it works in theory. Let me show you some of the animal data to show how it works in the animal model. So we treated um, some Sandoff uh, knockout mice. Um, and this particular slide is looking at the accumulation of GM2 ganglioside, or more specifically, how much this accumulation reduces in the brains of these knockout mice with treatment. Okay, so to orient yourself, to orient you on the slide, the knockout mouse model that was given placebo, in animal studies we call placebo vehicle, is in the blue line. So you can see high levels of GM2 ganglioside that's accumulated, okay? Now, we give three different doses, a low, a mid, and a high dose of the gene therapy, i.e. you saw the picture of the construct in the previous slide. This is the alpha and sub beta subunit DNA wrapped up in the self complementary AV9 capsid. We give three doses, a low, a medium, and a high dose group. And you can see a nice reduction, which is dose dependent, of the GM2 ganglioside. So the, uh, the lower dose is the black, so you get a little bit of reduction of GM2 ganglioside, the green is the mid dose, a greater reduction, and the yellow is the highest dose, so an even greater reduction of GM2 ganglioside, showing that you're actually reducing accumulated substrate increasingly with increasing doses of drug. That's all very well from a biomarker perspective, but does it actually make a, a difference to the functionality of the mouse model? And indeed it does. This is a survival curve. So basically um, we studied a group of different mice and observed them for different periods of time and dosed them, once again, the low, medium, and high dose. So the untreated knockout mouse, you can see the blue line, they die around about 17 or 18 weeks of age. And as you go up in dose, the low dose is a black, mid dose is the green, the high dose is the yellow, you can see a nice improvement in survival rates as you go up in dose, demonstrating a dose-dependent improvement in survival that is reflected by the dose-dependent reduction in GM2 ganglioside, which I showed you on the previous slide. Now, we actually have a very extensive animal data package. Um, it resulted in the approval of the, uh, uh, the, the, the opening of the clinical trial up in Canada, and we're moving towards also opening out in the US later on this year. I only have two slides of animal data, but, but there are there's quite a lot of, there's quite an extensive package that we uh, communicated to the regulators. 
That's the preclinical data. Let me touch on now a little bit the, uh, the patient-centric focus to our clinical development plans. So um, we truly believe at, at Taisha and, and my background as a pediatrician, it's really important to talk to families and talk to patients and more importantly, listen and learn and use that information, use that insight to help shape our clinical development and also shape our regulatory interaction. So this is the process we go through. Uh, and in the green, the, the green bar is really what is important for me. It's really listening to all of you, hearing your thoughts and helping that inform clinical trial design um, to make sure you have a, a positive experience during the clinical trial, but also we maximize our ability of proving whether the drug works or not in a way that is um, persuasive to the FDA and other regulators by weaving in some of those insights. Now we do this across our portfolio programs. We have a specific methodology that you can see here. We recruit patients to do an online survey. We do some content analysis. We then do a live video focus group to get more of the qualitative information. We produce a data analysis and a report. And the kinds of information we come out with, and this was from our GM2 um, patient focus groups, are really in two buckets. One is around the journey to diagnosis and the other is around uh, which symptoms are most challenging. So with regard to the journey to diagnosis, this is really important because many patients and families have quite a turbulent time coming to a diagnosis. And it's important to diagnose patients as early as possible, as quickly as possible in the course of their disease. Uh, and it's also important to identify patients in order to, in order to, to, to fuel patients entering a clinical trial. So that's why we spend time on the journey to diagnosis. And on the challenging symptoms piece, we wanna take some of these symptoms and really weave them into the clinical endpoints that we choose for our clinical trial. So for example, uh, we heard from you that um, seizures and the, the kind of distress associated with seizures are important. Quality of life matters are important. Uh, communication is important. And we make sure we do our very best to include these kinds of endpoints, often as secondary or exploratory endpoints, as part of the uh, clinical trial, in addition to the harder clinical endpoints that physicians, scientists, and the regulators would like us to collect. Now, the specific information on this, um, this patient engagement work, uh, we also like to share widely because we think it's informative to the community, not just this community, but, but broader in terms of drug development. There is a poster that outlines this. Uh, I think it's in your conference research exhibit hall. Um, so it's available to, to you all to have a look at. Um, I don't quite know how to access it, but, but uh, I'm sure it's somewhere. Um, okay, let's touch on the clinical trial plans um, and the updates here. As I said, we've had a very extensive package of preclinical data, which resulted in the opening of the clinical trial up in Canada. The reason we started off in Canada is because Stephen Gray, our gene therapy expert in partnership with Jagdeep Walia, the expert in Ontario, uh, have been talking to Health Canada very successfully. So we just thought, let's just run with that. We'll open up in Canada, uh, which we did at the beginning of this year. And we're now planning to open up in the US with an application to the FDA during the course of this year. Uh, we will be collecting clinical data, safety data and biomarker data. Uh, uh, and we're expecting to share some of the preliminary information by the end of this year, specifically on the clinical information we're collecting. We're collecting milestones, such as the ability to sit upright, reach out, grasp an object, head lag, um, and of course, biomarker data. The most important biomarker, I think, to look at is hex A levels within the CSF, but of course, we'll be collecting hex A in serum and uh, GM2 ganglion side as well. We are enrolling children who are aged less than 12 months. So the reason for that is we want to really uh, diagnose patients early and treat them early. And we also feel that's where the, the most rapidly progressive, most severe diseases. Um, so we, we really would like your help here. Um, you know, if you come across patients who are younger than 12 months of age, please reach out to us, let us know, and we'll facilitate them being treated either at the clinical trial site in Canada or when we open up in the US. We're very happy to take patients internationally. We've got systems set up to transfer patients from anywhere in the world to Canada and to the US when the US center opens up. So in summary, uh, our gene therapy approach, Tasia 101, allows the delivery of both the alpha and beta subunit wrapped up within one capsid to ensure a one-to-one -one ratio of alpha and beta subunit within each cell. We think that's the most efficient way of producing enzyme. Preclinical studies are persuasive. We show improvements in GM2 ganglicidosis, uh, sorry, GM2 ganglicide accumulation, survival and functional outcomes. Uh, we're partnering with uh, patient uh, community. Um, we uh, started our first in human study up in Canada and we'll be expanding that out 
into the US later on this year. Uh, as I say, we'd love to have your help in making sure we can successfully recruit those studies. And, uh, you know, here are some of my colleagues at, at Taisha. Um, I'm in the top left hand corner, as you can see, just below me is Emily, our head of patient advocacy. Uh, just next to me is Fred, who's our head of manufacturing. And next to Fred is RA, our CEO in the baseball cap. Um, and it's a really wonderful team that I work with. Uh, we have great collaborators, collaborators at UT Southwestern and um, also um, at Queen's University. So, so very happy to be here. And uh, I went through relatively quickly. We had a short amount of time, but I had a lot to say. And I'm happy to take any questions if, if need be. Well, you, thank you. That was uh, that was very informative and uh, and you know very very uh, rapid paced, but a, a lot, it certainly raised a few questions here. One of the questions that came up was, and, and I'm not sure how much you can share, but will the U.S. Is, how would you compare or contrast the U.S. design to the Canadian design, especially with regard to that age restriction that you had in the Canadian design? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so that remains to be seen. I think I think we're going to learn from the Canadian study and make some uh, adjustments and some improvements to the uh, US study. And that, of course, will need to be done in conjunction with the FDA. So I think part of the discussions with the FDA later on this year will be, um, will be look, this is what we learned from dosing two, three, four patients in the Canadian study. This is what we think we should do a little bit differently. This is how we build on our learners in the Canadian study. And, um, and that's what we'll do for the US study. Now, as a general comment in terms of age, our, our ultimate goal is to produce a gene therapy that is um, available to treat anybody with a GM2 gangliosidosis anywhere in the world. That's the ultimate goal. But when you design a study, you can't have an all comers type study because you have to, you have to limit it to some degree. Um, on two levels, usually, we'll limit it to some degree on age and we'll limit it to some degree on degree of functional capability, because that way you end up with a more homogenous group that can actually demonstrate a treatment benefit in that becomes persuasive to a regulator. So for now, the Canadian study is less than 12 months of age. Um, for the US study, I think it's still going to be an infantile population. We may expand a bit older than 12 months, but it remains to be seen initially. And then as time progresses, we learn more. I'm sure we expand into a, an older age group at some point. But when that happens, uh, I'm not sure at the moment. We've got, there's two questions and they're somewhat related. Um, and, you know, and the, the whole concept of gene therapy is one and done. And you talked about these different dose studies that you're doing. Could you speak about whether you see any kind of uh, multiple dosing or you know, booster doses or things like that in your plans? What did you learn in the, in the research that you've been doing right, right now in terms of getting it right? Sure, it's a really good question. So, so you're absolutely right. With the gene therapy, um, the intent is to give one dose and, and not have to repeat dosing. Part of the reason for that is, is that once you deliver a gene therapy, you deliver it in a viral vector capsid, we use AV9. Once you deliver it, the body mounts an immune response to AV9, produces antibodies to AV9, which means it's much harder to give a second dose. So we intend to, um, to only give one dose. Now, what that means is that we have to dose pretty aggressively in the clinical trial. We look at our preclinical data and we give a high dose. We give a dose that we think is going to be not only safe, but is also going to result in a, a, a fundamental clinical improvement in the patient. So we do that by modeling the dosing very carefully in the, um, in the animal models in order to help translate into a human. So that's the first thing. We dose at a high dose in the first in man. The second point I would make is that with, with brain cells, there's no ongoing turnover of brain cells. It's what we call a post-mitotic organ. Um, a liver, for example, keeps turning over. You get new cells regenerating all the time, but that's not the case with a brain cell. So if a brain cell is transduced and is producing protein from a gene therapy, we think it should produce protein from that, for, from that gene therapy for, for years, maybe decades. We don't anticipate actually needing to redose with this particular uh, program or indeed any of our uh, other uh, neurology uh, brain cell targeted programs um, at any point. Now, it may be the case that the drug lasts for three years, five years, 10 years, we don't really know. Um, in parallel, we are looking at ways of redosing um, and we can get into a long complex discussion about how we do that 
Part of it is by using different immunomodulatory uh, regimes. Part of it might be uh, doing dosing through alternative routes. Part of it might include um, techniques such as plasmapheresis to um, to drain off uh, anti to filter out antibodies that are present in the in the body. So um, to, to summarize, I don't think it's going to be necessary to redose, um, but we are looking at ways in which we we could do that if we indeed might need to. Thank you. Um, we have one one more question, and I, I think it's a, it's a good one if you could answer it because you're providing good clarity on these questions. People are hearing about CRISPR, right, and yeah. CRISPR-Cas9 and all that. Just kind of kind of discuss, explain what it is that you're talking about here versus what CRISPR is, without getting into too much detail, right? Sure. Yes, it's a really good question, and um, some of this comes to kind of definition, how we talk about things. So I guess there's this big group now of what we call genetic medicines. And part of you know, things like CRISPR fits into that, zinc finger technology fits into that, ASO, antisense oligonucleotide fits into that. Um, what we're doing specifically is gene replacement therapy, i.e. we've found out that a particular gene is either missing or mutated, in this case, it's, or in the case of Tay-Sachs, it's the alpha subunit of hex A. In the case of Sandoff, it's the beta subunit of, of hex A. And we are replacing the DNA, replacing the gene that, that codes for that particular enzyme. And we're wrapping it up in a vector, a viral vector capsid, delivering trillions and trillions of those molecules, allowing the capsid to enter the brain cells, the DNA to pop out and start producing the enzyme that's missing. Different genetic medicines do things differently. So CRISPR is all about gene editing. It's about cutting and cropping the DNA that's existing to try and reformulate DNA and make it produce enzyme that's missing. Um, ASOs use another different approach. You can also package RNA, which does a, you know, which, which can either silence genes or unsilence genes. So it is quite complicated, this field of genetic medicines. But what I will say is that, you know, if you look at precedent and where we are in the field, we now have two gene replacement therapies approved in the US, one of which is Olgesma for, um, uh, for SMA, the other is Luxterna for, for an eye disease. So I think the gene replacement therapies is probably, I wouldn't say it was easier, but, but there's more clinical precedent in that area than some of these other more exploratory methods such as, as CRISPR, Cas9, Zinc Finger, or some of those other technologies. Thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. Okay, um, we're going to move to our final presenter today.